I'd like to explain today a little bit of how biogeography can relate to world regional geography. And to do that, I'm going to use specifically the context of Australia and the Pacific Islands. The reason I use that region in my world regional geography course is the incredible diversity and uniqueness of the biogeography and the, the species types that we see in Australia as well as the Pacific. And also it helps us understand some important concepts of habitat fragmentation, ecological futures, sustainability, as well as just really looking at the big ideas of what we can refer to as island biogeography. The marsupials are obviously very prevalent in Australia, but why there? These are some important questions that biogeography and island biogeography can help us understand. There used to be marsupials all over the, the old world, but now they're limited primarily to Australia, as well as in Madagascar in some spots. That's going to let us get a little clue into why islands are we going to find these older versions of different types of life forms. So marsupials end up being an interesting idea and a point for us to be able to look at. So I'd like for us as well to look at why here. Some of these ideas I'm going to be referring to the book from David Kamen, The Song of the Dodo, an excellent book. I think it reads very much for a popular audience. But some of the key distinctions that he discusses here is why? Why is, this ha why is there more extinction on islands? And what about islands and their biogeography leads towards these particular circumstances? First of all, islands are going to be limited in terms of diffusion and dispersal of their species. So they're inherently bound and confined to these particular islands, unless you're going to be talking about birds that can be able to traverse from island to island. But even then, few, few species really want to travel over the open stretches of water beyond five miles or so. But also on islands, if you do have a limited number of species, that means you're going to have limited amounts of competitors. And that limited competition leads towards some species not necessarily evolving in the presence of certain predators. So one thing that um, Darwin, for example, he referred to some species on the Galapagos as being ecologically naive. When humans arrived, they weren't afraid of people. They weren't genetically programmed to be terrified of these large mammals. And that led towards a lot of their death, destruction, and other things of that nature. So that limited competition can, in some ways, shape the parameters on which they've evolved. But you can also see some fascinating species, because in the absence of a wider and more dispersed range of species, they've developed very specialized niches that you can see in the biology. I was at the Roger Williams Park Zoo not too long ago and saw this gorgeous map. And the thing that I loved about this was it really shows where you're going to see a world of difference. Even on islands, not all islands are the same. These islands of Borneo, Sumatra, and Java are connected to the Southeast Asian mainland through this land bridge. And every major ice age, that, that becomes prevalent. And we see a complete change where these species can interact with the mainland and that creates a different environment. And the islands that are not connected to the mainland, they're never going to have that genetic interaction with the other species and therefore they evolve along very different um, genetic tracks. And one thing I really liked about this in what Alfred Russell Wallace said, should civilized man ever reach these lands he will so disturb nature as to cause the disappearance and finally the extinction of these animals. Island biogeography is more fragile, as Alfred Russell Wallace was indicating, but also it was so different from anything that he'd experienced in Europe, Asia, and Africa that it would be literally almost this, this Garden of Eden as how, as how he perceived of it. And while Alfred Russell Wallace was there, he saw something that we can see in this map, but he did not see the ocean depths, because what we're looking at is quite specifically how the ocean levels drop. And he saw in his mind a distinction in how this can be happening. So he saw this. The species on this side of the line 
are very different from the species on the other side. One more connected to Asia and one more connected to Australia. This region, what, he ref what they refer to at the zoo at least as Australasia, that distinction in this line is a part of his observation of animals, but we can also see it more clearly with other geographic factors. One of them principally being this, depth of the sea. What Alfred Russell Wallace couldn't see underneath the ocean is that all of these islands that he saw on one side of the line were connected to Asia through essentially land bridges and a part of what's known as the Sunda Shelf. And as the sea level fluctuates, they become essentially a part of Asia. Whereas the islands he saw on the other side of the line were not nearly as deep and therefore did not have that interaction with those types. So as it says here, at least seven ice ages have chilled the earth over the last 1.6 million years. With each cooling, polar ice caps grow, ocean levels fall, and new habitats are created. When the planet warms, the oceans rise, relocating and isolating plants and animals. Isolated populations must then adapt to their new homes or they will slowly disappear. During the Ice Age 18,000 years ago, Australasia looked like the large map on the right and the one that we'd saw, seen previously. A lower sea level then creates land bridges between the islands, but the deep ocean trench between Bali and Lombok remained flooded with seawater. This water barrier prevented the mixing of larger Asian and Australian mammals. So the curious thing there was what he was noticing. Here's the island of Java and just off of connected by a land bridge you have Bali and then over here you have Lombok. Six miles apart but literally a world of difference. And so let's look at some of the islands that Alfred Russell Wallace was looking at but also some of the species. Here we can see in one connection what we have is the Sunda wrinkled horn wrinkled hornbill. But you'll notice that its connection is all on one side of that Wallace line. And what we notice here with this is these species, that line keeps coming up again and again. And we can see it here in the Bintarong again, Southeast Asian mainland, a little bit of Java, Borneo, and Sumatra are the islands where this is located. But if we flip on the other side of the Wallace line, we can see species like the Babarusa. This is a fascinating animal. I mean, it looks very much like this wild hog pig, but it is enormous. But also, notice the tusks. It's quite different. And what we can see and notice with this one is that it is exclusively on the island of Sibelis, or Sulawesi as it's called now, on the other side of the Wallace line, different from what you would find in mainland Asia and other places of that type. Because the islands connected to mainland Asia, Java, Sumatra, and Borneo, these are continental islands. They started out with all the life forms that existed on the continent, and then when the ocean levels dropped and they became islands, then their genetic diversity diverged and they received some of their distinction after that fact. Whereas islands that are disconnected from the islands of the continent, they don't have that interaction with these continental islands and they needed some more form of dispersal but that also means historically that they've been incredibly isolated from the world and from many of the other things that we can see throughout. So islands forming. You may think it doesn't happen very often but it does in fact. Here is the island of Surtsey off the coast of Iceland and what fascinates me about this one is scientists have left this one alone and said this will be an island specifically for exploration and discovery and let's let this be a living laboratory. And you can see that it formed with zero life forms on it but several decades later there's starting to be some green mosses flowing into this spot. Birds are using this as a migratory destination. It's starting to get a little bit of biota on this island. And what happens if we fast forward this process thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, mature the crop of species that are on this island? What ends up happening is that isolation plus great amounts of time leads towards ecological divergence. 
these species evolve in the absence of the other settings that are creating something that is happening on the mainland. Because of that, these geologically old islands that have the they are so incredibly distinct. So what we find here, let me just bring up some of the examples. The Komodo dragon, which as you imagine most lizards are no longer than a few inches, but in the absence of large bodied mammals that are predators, there was nothing to fill that ecological niche. And so the Komodo dragon, it as it gained got grew larger and larger, it was able to fill that opportunity and that void in the ecology of the islands in the south in Southeast Asia. What we see in the middle is may look like a rat or a mouse, but this is actually a primate. This is a lemur from the island of Madagascar, and it can fit in the size of your hand. I mean it's very, very small. But what happened was is it miniaturized to be able to fill the ecological niche of mice and rats, other rodents, because there were no rodents on the island of Madagascar. So where you see the Komodo dragon going towards gigantism, you see these lemurs going towards dwarfism. Those in either direction, that's what we see on remote and distant islands that have been ecologically untouched from other species and other interactions. And what we see on the very far right is the thylacine, just an incredibly strange looking species, but it's essentially a cat that hunted like very much, or a dog that hunted very much like a cat, but it's a marsupial. And it was essentially hunted into extinction. And a lot of people speculate that it was because of essentially what you can see with how you know, it was a competition with the dingo, that it was a, unable to be able to sustain itself. I'll send that hyperlink so you can be able to read the article on your own time. But what ends up happening with the thylacine, it really had a taste for sheep. And in Australia, can you just imagine, these early settlers being able to maintain their flocks was of eminent importance and it was just a disaster for the thylacine and it was hunted into complete extinction. What we also see on certain islands is how they can merge and share into in a wide range of species. One particular group here are the honey creepers in the island of Hawaii, but all of these related birds have taken on very different plumage and if you also look at the beaks, the beaks are the key to understanding the ecological niche that an animal fills. They are highly evolved for a variety of purposes. The short stout one maybe for cracking something open, the long thin ones for being able to extract um, insects from bark, things like that. This shows that this particular branch of honey creepers flourish tremendously and on the island of Hawaii. But that kind of flourishing in terms of many different species, what happens once you start introducing new threats. Globalization has really changed the dynamics of what happens on these islands because one thing that I would like to say is these islands are incredibly fragile. There are more extinctions on the islands of Hawaii than there were on all the other 49 states. It's not just because Hawaii faced extreme rampage and destruction, it was because the island species themselves were inherently more fragile because they had lost some of those traits that would save them from generalists. They were incredibly small populations that weren't able to essentially buffer against some kind of attack on their their native habitat. As people come into the different spots they're able to essentially here's a uh, image of the moa this massive bird flightless bird much like an ostrich from the islands of New Zealand. They were hunted into extinction when the Maori arrived because they were these large predators. They had no essentially skills to be able to fight off the humans and to be able to coexist in a world that did include humans that would attack and eat them. And so we see a lot of these specialists losing out towards the generalists. And this is just one of the things that we can see. We'll continue more in a bit. Thank you much for the next clip.